Configuring Windows Vista Applications. In this video, we're going to take a look at some of the new and updated applications that come bundled with Windows Vista. So we'll be looking at the way that contacts are implemented in Vista and how you can use them in other applications as well. We'll also take a look at Windows Mail, which is an upgrade of the older Outlook Express that came bundled with Windows XP. And we'll see how this new version has changed and what features it now comes with that makes it an overall much better product. Microsoft has also changed the Windows Calendar so that it now supports the industry standard calendar formats which enables you to interchange calendars with other applications and merge their calendars into yours. And finally, we'll take a look at the Windows Meeting Space application that lets you get a bunch of people together for a meeting and you can share your desktop, applications and files with people from all over the world. So let's take a look at contacts first and we'll see later on how these can be used with the Windows Mail client later in this video. Now for those of you that have used Microsoft Outlook or Outlook Express before or practically any other email client for that matter, you've no doubt created a list of contacts before and these are people that you generally send email to on a frequent basis such as your friends, colleagues and family. Well in Vista, Microsoft have taken the idea of creating contacts one step further and now you can create them outside of your standard email application and these can be used in any application that supports them such as a voiced over IP application for you to ring your friends all from the same contact list. Now since this is new it's not likely that a lot of third-party applications support the new Vista context yet but in time I imagine that a lot of people are going to start adding in this support. So we'll click on start and then we'll select our user account which in my case is the trainer account and then we'll click on the contacts folder. Okay now in Windows Vista contacts are slightly different than before. Now our contacts are simply just a file with a .contact file extension. And you can see that by default the only contact we have is one for our own user account. So if we double click on this contact we can fill in any or all of these details here and I'm not going to go through them all since they're all rather obvious. Here we can simply enter in the name and email address for this contact and over on the other tabs we can add in details for their home, their work, their phone numbers and so on. Okay so Let's go and create a new contact. So what we'll do is we'll simply right click and we'll choose new contact. And this is just going to throw up the same interface as we just saw before where we can enter in the details for this contact. So let's just call this contact Jason. And we'll give Jason an email address of jason at winstructorlab.com and I'm not going to bother filling in all of the other details here for now. We'll just simply click on OK. Okay, now if we right click on our contact, we can choose to open it. We could print out the details. On our action menu here, we could choose to email this contact or even call him or her if we have voice over IP hardware. Now we could also use our email application to send a copy of this contact to another person, which of course is certainly easier than writing out all of these details manually. Now, by the way, if you've upgraded to Windows Vista from Windows XP, then you'll find all of your old Windows address book contacts will automatically be upgraded to this new format. So there's nothing that you'll need to do. But if you've done a clean installation of Vista, then you can come up the top here and choose Import, and then you can import your old contacts from any of these style formats, including Outlook Express. Now aside from creating new contacts and importing and exporting our contacts, up the top here we could also create new contact groups where we can add in a bunch of contacts together and this will allow us to email all members of the group together in exactly the same way that distribution groups work in Outlook. So we'll create a new group and I'm just going to call this group here Friends and we'll click on the Add to Contact Group button and then we can add in the contacts that we want in our group. So I'm just going to add in both of these two contacts here, even though one of them is my account. So we'll click on the Add button. Okay, and there's our two accounts we've just added. Now from here we could also create 
a new contact if we like. We can select contacts in our list here and we can remove them if we no longer need them. And down the bottom here in this part of the window, we could also create a new contact that'll only appear inside this group and it won't be assigned its own contact file. And when you create one of these, it's going to appear in gray so you can identify that it's a contact that only appears inside this group. All right, well, we'll click on OK. And there's our new group with the file extension .group. All right, now that we have these contacts and groups sorted out, we can fire up our mail client and we can work with them. So we'll click on Start. And at the top here, we'll launch Windows Mail, which is the Windows Vista upgrade to Outlook Express that came with Windows XP. OK, well, like with other Microsoft email clients, since this is the first time that we're starting up Windows Mail, you can see it's going to ask us to create an account. But since I'm not going to be sending any email at the moment, I'm just going to click Cancel and we'll ignore this for now. OK, so this is Windows Mail. And I'm not about to go through all the features of the program since most of you would already be familiar with Outlook Express or the full Outlook client. So I'm going to restrict my discussion here to what's new in the product as well as anything else that might be relevant along the way. Well, since we just left off talking about what contacts are and how to create them, that's probably a good place to start. So if we come up here to the top and choose the Create Mail button, and then click 2. You'll notice here that we've already got a couple of people in our list and you'll probably have instantly recognised where these have come from. That's right, they're our contacts. So we can now simply select our contacts or our groups of contacts and click the 2 button or the carbon copy or blind carbon copy buttons to add them to the people we want to send this email to. Now we can also create contacts from here as well and these contacts that you create here will be placed in our contacts folder so everything points back to the one single place. Now once you have received any sort of email, in fact we can use this welcome email here as our example, we can add the sender of the email to our contacts as well. We can simply right click on our email at the top here and down the bottom we can choose to add sender to our contacts. Now if we go back to our contacts folder, you can see here that we have a new contact for our Microsoft Windows mail team. So it's pretty easy to add in new contacts as you just saw. Now as for the rest of the options in Windows mail, the only real things that have changed since Outlook Express, apart from perhaps the nicer looking window here, are the junk email options and the phishing filter. So we'll click on the tools menu and we'll select junk email options. Now, like the full Outlook client, Windows Mail now supports analyzing email as it comes into your computer to see if it's junk email or spam. Now, whilst this technology isn't infallible, and even the best solutions out there still miss some emails and they let them through, this is a welcome feature since we all get spam, and quite honestly, this feature works pretty well in capturing a lot of spam. Now, if you like, you can set this to not filter emails to try and catch spam and personally I'd never use this option as the filter is pretty good and it saves you the trouble of manually deleting all of the spam from your inbox. But it will still move any email sent from block senders directly to the junk email folder. So the default setting here is set to low which is going to catch the most obvious spam emails but that said this setting is still pretty good and in most cases it not only catches a lot of spam but it rarely classifies your genuine email as spam. So I'd go as far as saying that most of you listening to this video won't need to change this setting at all. Of course, you can change this setting to high, which is designed to catch as much spam as possible, but like with your low option, it too can and often will classify genuine email as spam and it's going to dump that into your junk email folder. So regardless of whether you set this to low or high, I'd recommend that you check your junk email folder periodically or at least before you delete it just to see that no legitimate email has been classified as spam. If it has, you can then add those senders to your safe list and they'll no longer be put in the junk email folder. Now what I prefer to do on a new system is to leave the default setting at low 
and once it's been running for a while and I've added most of the sender's addresses to my safe list, then I'll set it to high. Ultimately, that's up to you, but just remember to check your junk email folder every now and then, as it probably will contain some legitimate email. Now we could also choose to only allow emails into our inbox if the sender is on our safe list, and this will certainly avoid almost all spam, but of course if someone isn't on your safe list, then they'll be classified as spam every single time. So if you aren't running an accurate, up-to-date safe list, you'll probably be missing out on a lot of legitimate email. Now finally, we can permanently delete all email that's classified as spam, rather than just moving it to the junk email folder, and I don't like to choose this option myself, since I prefer to at least be able to check for legitimate emails, but you do have that option as well. Now on the Safe Senders tab, we can add in email addresses for people that we do want to receive email from, and we can simply click Add, and then add in a specific email address or an entire domain that we choose to allow. Now also by default, we'll allow email into our inbox that's been sent from any of our Windows contacts, and we can automatically add in anyone that we email to our safe senders list as well. Now the Block Senders tab is exactly the opposite of the Safe Senders tab, and anyone that we add to this list will have their email automatically moved to the junk email folder. Now on the International tab, we can further prevent spam by blocking email coming from certain countries, or email that contains different languages. So if we select the Block Top Level Domain List button, we can block email coming from other countries by simply placing a check next to the country that we want to block. So if we didn't want to receive any email from, say, Albania, we can simply place a check in this box, and that'll prevent any email from hitting our inbox if it comes from anywhere that has a .al extension. Now if we click on the Blocked Encoding List button, we could block email that contains characters from any of these languages. Now often spammers will use other languages to bypass spam filters, so if I didn't want to receive emails that contains Chinese characters, for example, then I could choose Chinese from this list here, and that's going to prevent any email from hitting our inbox that contains these languages. And that's great, since personally I find that probably about 5% of my spam contains these sorts of characters, and the traditional spam filters don't generally pick this up. So this feature here is really useful. Now the final tab we have here is the Phishing tab, which defaults to protecting our inbox for potential phishing attacks. Now, if you haven't yet seen our video on Internet Explorer 7, which discusses what phishing attacks are, they're basically just attempts to get personal information from you. And most often, in the case of email, these will be fraudulent emails that appear to come from your bank, or eBay, or PayPal, or any other popular type of place where it's likely that you'll have some type of account. Now what these phishing emails do is tell you that you need to go and update your details or your account's going to be closed in the hope that you click on the link they've put in the email, go to their website and enter in your password. Now these phishing attacks are often fairly ingenious since they'll send you off to a website that looks like the original site. Let's say for argument's sake it's eBay or PayPal. You'll click a link that looks like it's going to PayPal but actually goes to the attacker's site instead. And they'll have crafted a page that looks identical to the original PayPal or eBay site. So you enter in your username and password, and now they have your details. So they can go and transfer your money elsewhere. Now obviously, this isn't a good thing to have happen to you. And above all, I can only stress that if you do receive an email like this, and if you're unsure that it's legitimate, don't click the link. Instead, open up a new browser, and then manually go off to PayPal or whatever the site is, and log in that way or send their support staff an email to see if the concern is legitimate. Now, 99 times out of 100, you'll find that the email was indeed a phishing attack. So this is good having this feature, as it can help Windows Mail identify these types of emails and move them directly to the junk email folder if you like, which I would recommend. Now, once you have a message in your inbox or even in your junk email folder, and you want to classify the sender as spam or as a person who is allowed to send you email, simply right-click on the email, 
and choose Junk Email. And from here, you could add the sender to your safe list, which will allow any email from them to be allowed into your inbox. You can add their entire domain into your safe list, or you could block the user or add their entire domain to the block list. And then any emails in future from this user or this domain would then be dropped directly into your junk email folder. Okay, now, one of the other common uses for Windows Mail is browsing and contributing to news groups. In built to Windows Mail is this link here for Microsoft Communities. And if we click this, it's firstly going to ask us if we want to turn this feature on. Now, unlike standard news groups, which simply allow people to post messages for other people to read and reply to, this community's feature allows people to post a rating for the post, and that allows you to cut through the junk posts and only view the ones that other people have said are good. So I'm going to say yes. We'll choose the top option here to turn on both news groups and the community's feature. And it's going to go off and download a list of news groups and you'll notice that if we scroll down this list, you're only seeing Microsoft news groups here. But depending on which ISP you're using, they'll have their own news group server, which you can log on to, and you'll be able to see many, many more. So to find a particular news group, let's just type in a word that we want to search for. Let's type in Windows Vista. And we'll ignore these top options here and we'll scroll down. And here's a good one. Windows Mail. So we'll select that and we'll click on the subscribe button, which places this icon here next to it. So you can now see that we're subscribing to it. And you can select more if you like, but I'm just going to leave my subscription at this one here and click on OK. All right, well, there's our news group that we're subscribing to. And if we select it in the left hand side, you can see down the bottom here, it's going to load up to the first 300 messages by default. And just like with our email, it's going to show these messages in our list at the top here. Now, if we select any of these messages, down the bottom in the preview pane, we can read the message. Now, at the top, we could choose to reply to this message just as we would any email message. And this will reply directly to the person that sent it, or we can reply to the entire group which is going to post our message here so that everyone can read it. Now, if we scroll over to the right here of our list, if any posts have been rated, you'll see this star icon here next to the post so you can identify if the message is worth reading. Perhaps it contains useful information or someone's provided a good solution to the question that might have been asked. Now, like with our email, if we have happened to have struck up a nice conversation with one of these people from our news groups here, we could also right click on any of the messages and then add that sender to our contact list as well. Okay, well, the next product that we're going to cover in this video is the Windows Calendar. And we've got a couple of ways of launching the calendar. We can either launch it from within Windows Mail by clicking on the calendar icon at the top here, or we can click on Start. We will choose All Programs. And up the top here, there's Windows Calendar. So we'll run it. And it pops up with probably what you'd expect it to see in any typical calendar. Now, the real beauty of this calendar is that sure, we can put in dates and appointments and so forth into our calendar. We could also add in new calendars as well. So by default here, you can see that we've got one calendar and that's for my trainer account. So to add in a new one, we'll simply right click and we'll choose New Calendar. So let's say that I'm a consultant and I work for several companies, or perhaps I do other activities outside of work, like Coach Little League or something else. Well, I can create a different calendar to separate these activities if I like. So I'm going to call this calendar Coaching, and it will automatically be assigned a different color. In fact, this has only been assigned a slightly different color of green. So up the top here, we could change this to a, a different color if we like. All right, so let's go and add in an appointment. We'll say at 4 p.m. we have training. So we'll double click on 4 p.m. And I'm going to type in training. And there's our entry right there. Now, because we'd selected our coaching calendar on the left-hand side, you can see that this is now a purple color, which is assigned to our coaching calendar. But if we've made a mistake and we wanted this to be put in our trainer's calendar, 
we can come over here to the right and from this drop down box we can simply change that. Okay, so here we can set our start and end date as well. We can set reminders. But down the bottom here, we can also invite attendees as well. So if we click this button, where do our attendees come from? Our contacts, of course. So you can probably now start seeing how these contacts are interacting with several applications, not just email. So we could invite Jason, so we'll select him, we'll click on the To button, and then we'll click OK. Now if we want to remind Jason about this appointment, then we can click on the Invite button and send him an email as well. Now something else that the Windows Calendar supports is subscribing to other people's calendars as well. Now if we click on the Subscribe button at the top of this window, we'll need to enter in the URL of a location where there's a calendar stored that we wish to add to our own calendar. Now in many cases, you'll probably want to merge calendars with your spouse or other family members or friends, but you can also download public calendars, like the game times of your favourite sports teams or when TV shows are airing and so on. So if we click this link here, this will take you off to a Microsoft website and at the top here, you can see other sites that have internet calendars. So let's just click on one of these here. We'll say calendardata.com. Okay, well, on this site, we can then browse calendars. But let's choose one of these links on the right. We'll say TV schedules. And if we scroll down our list here, we could say add in the Desperate Housewives calendar to ours. So let's go and click that. Then we'll need to choose the Windows Vista calendar. And you can see we've got a message asking us if we do want to add information from this site. So we'll say allow. And you can see it's now populated the correct link for us. So we'll click next. And our calendar will then subscribe to the internet calendar. Now the default name for my new calendar is fine, but you can change that if you like. We could also choose to update this calendar if we like, and that's probably a good idea in case those values change. Otherwise, our calendar won't know about the change. So I'm going to change this to check every single day. And then we can also set reminders for ourselves and tasks if we like. All right, well, we'll click Finish. And I'll just close this website now as we no longer need it. And over here on the left, we now have a new calendar. So we're able to schedule our lives around the episodes of Desperate Housewives. Now, of course, we can go the other way and publish our own calendar as well. So if we select our calendar, say our coaching calendar here, over here on the right, we can click on this publishing link. And we can either publish our calendar to the internet if we have an ISP that supports it, or have access to publish it to some other site. Or we could save this output to a file by clicking on the Browse button. And we can dump it somewhere on a hard drive and then simply email it to our friends. And if you like, you can also include your notes, your reminders, and your tasks in your calendar as well when you publish it. All right, so this new calendar is pretty good since Microsoft decided to support the web standard for calendars and not run with a proprietary system. And as you've seen, it's pretty easy to use. All right, well, the final thing that I wanna talk about in this video is the Windows Meeting Space application so we'll go and click on Start, we'll select All Programs, and then we'll launch Windows Meeting Space. Now the first time that you run Windows Meeting Space, it will ask you if you do want to set this up. And the reason that it's going to do this is for that to work properly, it's going to have to enable some rules in the Windows Firewall and start up a couple of services for this to work. So if you're at all concerned about any possible security implications, it might be wise to have a chat with your firewall or network administrator in your company. But if that person is you, well, I suppose that's going to be an interesting discussion. Anyway, we'll say yes, and we'll click continue on our user account control message. And the first thing we'll have to do is enter in a display name, which by default, as you can see, is our username. Now we'll automatically be signed in whenever Windows starts and by default we'll allow invitations from anyone 
although we can change this to only trusted contacts, which are contacts that have a digital certificate or no one. Well, I'm just going to accept the defaults here and click OK. All right. Now that we're set up, we're dropped into the main screen for Windows Meeting Space where we could start a new meeting, we could join an existing meeting, or we could open an invitation file if we've been sent one. Now, in order for me to be able to show you this running, I need to have another machine that I can talk with. All right, now I've just switched over to another Vista machine I have here on my network, and we'll have to quickly set up Windows Meeting Space here as well. So I'm going to click Start, All Programs, we'll launch Windows Meeting Space. We'll say Yes to allow it to continue, and then we'll click Continue on our user account control message. Now, since I am logged on with my trainer account on this machine as well, I'm just going to change this display name to student so it's easy to identify each person in our meeting and then we'll click on OK. All right, now I've just switched back to my trainer's PC here. So let's start up a new meeting and we'll assume for the sake of this video that I'm using Windows Meeting Space to provide some distance learning. But of course, I could be using it simply to have a meeting with some staff members or practically any other reason that I'd want to get a group of people together. So we'll click start a new meeting and we'll need to give this meeting a name. I'm just going to leave the default here and then we'll need to enter in a password. And this password will also need to be entered by the other people that wish to attend our meeting. So you will need to inform those people of the password by phoning them or emailing them or getting it to them via some other mechanism. All right, well, we'll click on the green arrow and that'll create our meeting. And as you can see, now our meeting is active. All right, now I've just switched over to our student's PC and his PC has already found the new meeting and it can either attempt to join it or we could go back to our trainer's PC and send our student an invitation. So let's go back to our trainer's computer. Okay, back on our trainer's computer, if we click on the Invite People link here, we can now invite our student. Now, the default is to make the student have to enter in the password, although we can uncheck this box so that anyone could join. And if we click on the Invite Others button, we can either send our invitation in an email or save the invitation to a file, which we can then send them in another way, such as over MSN or saving it to a file share or someplace else. Okay, well, we'll click Invite People again. We'll invite the student and we'll click Send Invitations. Now, at the top here, we can see that the student has now been added, but their status is pending as they haven't yet accepted our invitation. Okay, back on our student's computer, we now have a new window that's appeared here, which is now inviting me to this meeting. So I'm going to click Accept and we'll need to enter in the password. So we'll type that in and we'll click on the green arrow button here. And then we'll be joined to the meeting. Okay, and you see here that we're now connected. Okay, so back on our trainer's PC, from here we can see we can now share a program or our desktop so that other people can see what's on my computer just like they would if we were using remote desktop or remote assistance. Now we could also share files by clicking on the add a handout link and then simply browsing to the location of the file that we want each member of our meeting to have. All right, so let's go and start sharing. When we click this link, you see here we get a message asking are we sure that we want other people to see our desktop. So I'm going to say OK and we can choose to either share a program or a file or our desktop itself. So let's share a file first. So we'll leave this top option here and we'll click share. And then we can browse to the file we want to share. So I'll just go to my pictures folder here and our sample pictures and we'll choose a picture and we'll click on open. Okay, well, there's our picture. And if we now switch over to our student's PC, they'll be able to see what we're seeing. 
Okay, so back on the student's PC, that's the image that's being shared, and we certainly can view it, but we can't do anything with it. So whilst we're having this meeting, let's say I decide as a student that I need to take control of the trainer's computer. Let's say he's issued a challenge for me to demonstrate my skills. So at the top here, we can see that the trainer is in control. But if I click on this link, I can now choose to request control. Now back on our trainer's computer, at the top right here in orange, we can see that we've got this orange give control message here, which indicates that someone has requested control from us. So if we click this box, we can see that that person was our student. So we'll click student. And now our title bar up here has changed to show that we are in fact sharing this program and the student is now in control. Okay, we're now back on our student's computer. So now we have control, so we can cycle through these images, as you can see, since we do have control over the trainer's computer. Now, if it looks a little small here in this window, you can click on this blue icon here at the top, and that's going to switch this application to full screen. And if we click on the blue icon again, it's going to return it back to Windows mode. Now, just like with MSN Messenger, if we as the student need to temporarily step away from this meeting, we can do that, but it's good manners to let people know that we're not here. So if we click on this little student icon on the right, we can set ourselves to be busy. We could be right back or away. And if we choose personal settings, we can then also choose to change our picture as well if we like. Now, one thing to be aware of is that if me as the student or the trainer happens to close this application, then the sharing will be terminated. And that's because we only chose to share this one single application. So if me here as the student clicks on this little close icon over here, there you can see sharing has now been terminated. So if we wanted the student to be able to run right on our system and launch whatever they like, then we'll have to have chosen to share our desktop instead of a single application. Now you can also choose to send private messages to meeting members as well if you like, by simply right clicking on their name and then choosing to send a note. And this works in exactly the same way as MSN Messenger does. Simply type in what you want to tell the other person and then hit send. But if you've got the time and you feel like being a little bit artistic, we could also click on the ink button here and then we can draw pictures and send them as well. Okay, well, back on the trainer's computers, we can see that we've got a couple of messages here from our student and we can simply chat with them by replying to their messages. All right, so let's go and quickly see desktop sharing in action, although it's basically the same as our application share. And we'll click on share here and then we'll click OK. We'll choose desktop and click share. All right, now we could minimize our meeting space application and use our desktop just as we would normally. And our meeting attendees would now be able to watch my desktop as you'd expect. Now, another thing that we can do with the meeting space application is to send our desktop to a network projector as well. So up the top here, if we click on the options menu and choose to connect to a projector, this allows us to either search for or manually enter in an IP address or URL to a network projector and have our screen displayed on that. And this is really cool because I could be sitting at home, a bunch of people all over the world signing in and I could have an auditorium of people watching on a projector and they're all able to see what's going on at once. So this is a great option to be aware of if you have the required hardware. All right, well, we're still sharing our desktop here. So to stop sharing our desktop, we can either stop it by clicking this link here at the bottom or at the top here, you can see we've got these little icons here to stop or pause the sharing or to see how our shared session looks. 
Now, as you can see on my small screen resolution here, it does look a little messy. So I'd probably not turn this feature on unless you do have a decent sized monitor. Now at the top here in our menu bar, we can invite more attendees. We could share our desktop, but we're already sharing it anyway. So if we click on stop sharing for a moment, we can see that option comes back. Now we can add handouts, which is the same as clicking on this link down the bottom here. And when we no longer need to be a part of this meeting, we can click on meeting and we can simply leave the meeting. Now Windows Meeting Space, as you've just seen, is a very easy to use application and it allows people from anywhere in the world to get together, discuss ideas, problems, or simply just to waste time like so many meetings do but why waste time as a small group when you can waste time with people all over the world? But all jokes aside, this really is a good application which works great and it allows lots of people, no matter where they are in the world, to get together to collaborate on ideas all at once. And if you haven't used it and you're part of a large company, I'd imagine you probably have a good idea of where an application like this would be valuable. Now in this video, we've discussed some of the new and updated applications that come with Windows Vista. We've looked at the way Windows Vista implements contacts, which is a much better way of doing things since they can now interact with other applications, not just your email client. And speaking of email clients, we looked at some of the new features in Windows Mail, particularly the junk email options, which are great, as well as the new communities features for news groups, allowing you to rate posts so you can weed out the unhelpful and spam posts from legitimate ones. Finally, we looked at the Windows Calendar application and how you can use it to merge other people's calendars with yours and then Windows Meeting Space, which is an application which isn't used as often as it probably should be, largely because a lot of people don't know about it. So now that you do know about it and seen just how easy it is to get working, bring it up in your next meeting and consider putting it to work for your company.